the last 10 to 20 years has seen a great surge of hatred towards the Muslim community. Sisters' hijabs have been pulled off and slurs and attacks on sisters has increased. Coined as Islamophobia, we look at what it really entails and how should we as Muslims react to this atmosphere of fear? To find out, stay tuned here to Women's AM. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome again to your morning dose of Women's AM. You are joining me, Adama, and my Women AM cronies, Liz and Aisha. And we have an exciting lineup for you guys. So sit back and relax as we look at a topic scaling the media and within our communities. So how are you guys today? Alhamdulillah. 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 And subhanAllah, I was thinking a bit about the world and, and how multicultural it is, mashallah. And I wanted to know what you ladies thought about accents. And if you didn't have the accents that you had, which accent would you like? So I'm going to start with you, Aisha. Okay, I know a lot of people actually cringe at the idea, but I ha absolutely love it, and it's the American accent. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> it's a really bad take. <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. And what about you, Liz? Um, you know, to be honest, I do actually really like the English accent. I know it's really boring, mm. but, you know, my husband's Algerian, so I feel I should say, you know, the Algerian accent. Oh, <laughs> don't you so just say it, just because you're married to him. <laughs> Well, for me, I'm actually quite interested in the Jamaican patois, a, group, a, a lot of amongst Caribbean people. So I wish I could talk like them, but I have a really bad take on it. Okay. <laughs> We've heard you speak it, so you're very good at it, mashallah. <laughs> I beg to differ. <laughs> now let's move on to our first segment of the morning with News Bites. In this segment, we take a look at the headlines and discuss articles of interest. So, sisters, which articles have you got for us today? And I'm going to start with you, sister. Well, I've got a variety um, of news stories. Um, I'm going to go first to The Guardian. Um, President Barack Obama speaks about the economy and growing economic inequality in Washington. Um, oh. This is uh, obviously about the, uh, the speech that he made about the minimum wage and how he was going to increase it with the aim to reduce the gap between rich and poor. So interesting story. I'm uh, sure we'll be keeping an eye on that one. Um, BBC News um, uh, story. Yasser Arafat was not poisoned, leaked a French report. Um, again, this is in response to a report previously by Swiss scientists that claimed there was an unexpectedly high level of polonium, um, but this has now been um, kind of quashed by this most recent study. Again, I'm sure, you know, this is, um, this is going to continue. Um, uh, in the metro this morning, um, apparently Britain has a nation of child smokers with up to 600 children, some as young as 11, taking up the habit every day. 600. Which is shocking. Um, and again in the metro, all of your Twitter tattle could, lead, could land you in court. Um, and this is referring to um, using Twitter or Facebook to talk about um, legal cases, um, you know, current legal cases. Um, Peaches Geldof recently posted um, the names of the two women who are involved in the Ian Watkins yeah. scandal. And, and obviously this is the kind of backlash from that. Um, but, you know, interesting you know, worth knowing that your, your tweets could land you up in court. Um, also quite a funny one, I got found in the Huffington Post. Uh, spike away vest protects your personal space on cramped commutes. Now this is really interesting. A designer's <laughs> come up with a vest that's got spikes on it. Uh, I wish I had a picture so you could see yeah. this, but it's got uh, spikes on it to kind of protect your personal space, you know, when you're on a crowded tube and you're kind of mushed up to people. I know how that feels. Yes. <laughs> Do you really want everybody just like going, this annoying woman, she's like taking up my space. I, I have to be honest, this morning on the tube, I really wished I had the spiky vest. <laughs> I can't same lie. here, yes. same here, especially when it's all up in your face. Well, Baba Club yes. for that, Liz. We're now going to go shortly to a clip. Pakistan's 16-member women's kabaddi team arrived in India to compete for the first time in the Kabaddi World Cup 2013. 
The fourth Kabaddi World Cup is being held in India from November the 30th to December the 14th. We are participating for the first time in the World Cup, but we are feeling really good. It's a very good game and we are very happy that we have come to India to participate in the World Cup. After coming to India, we feel just the same as in Pakistan. It seems like our own country. Pakistan's 18-member men's team and officials, coaches, managers and media coordinators accompanied the women's team. The team coach, Aisha Kasi, seemed positive about Pakistan's participation. I just want to say that we're going to mark history with this game. Along with the passion for this sport, the fitness level of all the participants is very high and we've improved our game in the two and a half month camp that we've had. So we are just going to participate with a very positive mind and try to give our best so that people notice the Pakistan's women team. According to the players, the sport is becoming increasingly popular in Pakistan, which has led to the formation of the women's team. That's an interesting feature, Kabaddi. Yes, yeah, Kabaddi. It's a very, it's an old sort of uh, game. Um, but I'm quite surprised to hear that there's a first female uh, group, um, uh, Kabaddi group. And the thing is, is that it's quite a very touchy, touchy uh, yeah. game. Um, you know, you, you're actually you're there's two there's two teams and there's a group of like like 11 men or something on each side and then one um, opponent on the opposite team will come uh, forward and you have to try and grab him and it's very physical and I can't really imagine like you know the women playing this kind of games especially yeah. if you have a lot of um, men watching this um, during mm. the tournament and you could imagine how inappropriate it, it is be. it will be I think for sure um, but it, it'll be good to see what happens what actually happens what, yeah, that takes exactly. place isn't it exactly. well sister Liz you've got a main article um, yeah well the story that I've actually been following it's been um, a front page article all week actually yeah. is the um, Nigella story um, and in the metro this morning it says Nigella I did use cocaine, so she's admitting the uh, the recent accusations by her um, ex-husband Charles Saatchi. And I mean, this is there's so many kind of levels to this story. Obviously, you know, there was the uh, a picture of Charles Saatchi holding her by the throat, um, mm. you know, a, a few months ago. Um, she claims, you know, lots of emotional mm. and financial abuse. Um, obviously, the drug use. Um, two of their former employees are accused of fraud and uh, uh, stealing. Mm. So there's really, you know, just so many. Um, um, different facets to this um, mm. and it's really just another example of a very very public divorce a very mm. personal situation being made very very public and it, it's it's very um, it's sad, really sad when you think yeah. about the families involved and the children and you know the kind of backlash um, that, that this is going to have in the future and yeah. Look, the, the funny thing with Nigella is that not too long ago she was seen like wearing like a burkini bathing yeah. suit in yeah. Australia and you're like warmed up to the idea, okay, Nigella, she's really cool, she's wearing, you know, our stuff. And then you kind of ha have her doing this and, mm. you know, you can ruin your image and you do, like, she's, okay, she is a celebrity chef yeah. and, you you know, she welcomes you into her home and things like that and then you kind of hear this and you have a completely you have different a very bitter view. image. Well, this yeah. is very yeah. much her image, isn't it? The home family, family, um, yeah. you know, mumsy, you know, cooking yeah. up wonderful meals out of bits and bobs she's got in the exactly. cupboard kind of yeah. thing. And, and then obviously something like this is really going to destroy all that, isn't Definitely. it? Definitely, especially yeah. she's such, such a successful exactly. sort of TV career yeah, as well. Exactly. And all of that's kind of perhaps gone down the drain Absolutely. for shame. And for you, sister... Um, I yes, um, I've got um, a headline in Sky News actually. A royal prank DJ Mel Gregg quits radio company. Um, I believe like a year ago, remember there was that royal prank from the Australian yeah. DJs um, who called um, in regards to Kate Middleton's um, pregnancy at that time. Um, basically, the female broadcaster, she has quit the company. Um, she actually was um, against the call itself um, and she didn't want to, um, you know, sort of, she didn't like the idea. She was very upset, very traumatized. She left the organization. However, her co presenter was um, uh, said that regardless of all that's happened in the past few months, I'm still at the top of my game. So it felt good to see my name at the top of the final leaderboard. It's kind of a bit. Big contrast, it really is, isn't it? Yeah, that's the thing about is, the media industry. It's a very, very, uh, very 
it's a very very it, weird game, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But if you have, yeah. if you want to get ahead, you have to do all these crazy things with all it these celebrities it. getting involved as well. And Kate Middleton, she's a real person, like everyone else. She did have her privacy. Yeah, she did. Lady. I mean, obviously, you know, the lady in question who uh, who committed the suicide that was very traumatic in itself. But yeah. Yeah. you know, it's just such a shame that it had to end like this. You know, in all accounts. But yeah. um, my next report is on the BBC News. Um, I'm going to take you to India now. Mm -hmm. um, Umakant Mishra, an Indian postman cleared of stealing less than one dollar after 29 years, which is really sad. Um, this Indian uh, postal worker, he um, was accused of like stealing less than one dollars um, and from the postal company. And um, he attended like 348 times uh, to court. Um, he was just last week um, acquitted of, of all accounts and basically due to this whole um, incident he had to sell his house he had to sell his land and he eventually became bankrupt it obviously affected oh, his yeah. life these past 30 years and um, and now hopefully well he'll be suing um, he'll be asking for compensation about that which mm -hmm. I hope he gets um, and basically I mean I saw this in the Metro it's to do with um, Katy Perry is actually being appointed as UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador in New York. Uh, the 29-year-old said that she was moved by the incredible joy among children and the role highlighted there was more to life than possessions. I mean, mm -hmm. Liz and I, we were really talking about this because, I mean, you know, a singer, you know, becoming a, a role model yeah. and to this extent, I like well, do have you do have Bob Geldof and Bob Geldof. You know, he was really known for raising money for yeah. Africa. Okay, Live, yeah. Aid, Live right. Aid and things yeah. like that. I mean, you know, with Kate Perry, what is she promoting? Mm. Um, is she the best of uh, role models? There are other people mm. who could have been um, an amazing uh, ambassador. Mm. Was she, I don't know what the reason was for and her, her lyrics are and songs are very questionable, it's, aren't they? It's very controversial yeah. as well. And you know, do you want Want children to be looking up to her, but you know, I guess UNICEF was like all up in praises for her. Um, and uh, my final article is in the Evening Standard: Horror of Sex Slaves Held in Cages. Um, this is a very traumatic story. Um, a basically, a lady called Hazel Thompson. Uh, she conducted an 11-year investigation yeah. of um, this sex slave um, industry. She said that girls in cages. Uh, were put in there against their will and would men come to these brothels if they knew they were paying for sex mm. they were paying to rape a slave so these girls they were actually put in the cage against their will and it's just it was a small confinement cage and um, and this is all they ever came to know um, they were you know they've lived all these years and there was a girl actually sorry I'm going into it now um, uh, there was a girl who's been in since a little girl being a, a, a slave um, in the set of slave trade mm. and uh, she says that prostitute is all she knows and even Allah. though she's like been um, uh, sort of been offered to come out of it she mm. actually just says no this is all I know but these men they've been they, you know, over 20,000 women and girls have 20, been forced 000. into this and this is all based in Mumbai and you think like everybody goes on about like India it's yeah. very prosperous yeah. and yeah. you know there is like lots of these kind of There's incidences. Black markets are happening. Driving yes. Yes. Aren't and they? Yeah. you can see the uh, the uh, gap between the rich and the poor isn't it like yeah. you know and so subhanallah that's such a sad story but inshallah we'll keep an eye on those kind of stories inshallah ta'ala jazakum yeah. for your article choices jazakum khair and sisters we are off to a short break now but don't go anywhere as we have lots more coming up see you in a few minutes when we delve straight into our main discussion in her views where we discuss islamophobia assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome back. You're watching Women's Aim with myself, Adama, and on our panel today, we have our special guests, Frances Legg, Liz, and Aisha. How are you guys doing, mashallah? Okay, yeah? How are okay, you great. doing? <laughs> you <laughs> welcome <laughs> back, uh, back to the show. It's great thank to have you. you here. Thank you, great um, to be here. Thank you. <laughs> um, how did you get into campaigning against Islamophobia? Okay, well, I came to Islamophobia, the issue of Islamophobia, really through the anti-war movement. Um, I was involved in campaigning against the war on terror and in terms of the pro-Palestinian movement. And as I quickly came to realise that um, 
attacks on civil liberties and attacks on Muslims really came um, as part and parcel of that. Mm. Um, and it's really the duty of all people in the anti-war movement to tackle that problem. Yeah, definitely. It's fantastic. And when did you actually start getting into <coughs> doing this? Probably uh, during university. University, great. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I understand your organisation had um, Islam, uh, Islamophobia Awareness mm -hmm. Month. Was it last month? It was November, yes. And so what are the yeah. aims uh, of that? We aim to really popularise um, an anti-Islamophobia discourse. Um, so we organised a series of film screenings, um, meetings, um, and events um, to really kind of put it on the mainstream agenda. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Sounds great. So what are your future plans? Next year we hope that the event will be even bigger than before and we hope to hold events in even more <coughs> workplaces, um, community groups um, and schools. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really yeah, good. That's fantastic, great. fantastic work that you, you're doing within the community as mm -hmm. well and trying to address this issue as well. Yeah. Well, moving on now to today's topic, let's go straight to her views where we'll be discussing Islamophobia. Islamophobia has steadily been on the rise with more reported cases of violence and abuse against Muslims. Monitoring groups often say that hate crime is underreported.